Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. So we were kind of in the end of like verse 18, Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, whom he will he hardeneth, and we covered that. Uh, remember that ten times Pharaoh hardened his own heart before God hardened his heart. So he, it wasn't that God came in and hardened him each time. He hardened his own heart. Okay? Uh, and you have to go back to last week now. That thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, uh, O man, who art thou that replies against God? In other words, you know, who are you to challenge the, the, the God and, and uh, what he does? And um, shall the thing formed say to him that formed? Uh, it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and unto another unto dishonor? What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endure with, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? That to me is a, is a very key statement. He endured those. In other words, he gave him the opportunities. See, if you take Romans 9 out of its setting and out of all the things and, with, and take it outside the Bible and, and things like, you know, God's not willing that any should perish. Or that he's not willing, he died for everybody and all the different things that outside of absolute, complete, sovereign election, um, you can come up with that doctrine. If you take the Romans 9 out and forget everything else the Bible says, then you can come up with that doctrine. And then when you start from that premise, you just cram everything into that. And as we said last week, so, uh, election is not based on a whimsical, uh, I, I was sitting down, my knee was bothering me, I got up here, it's, it's not bothering me now, so I'm going to stand up. I hate that bench for sitting. It hurts your backside. Hello, I need, I need like a recliner to teach for. Hallelujah. No, election is based on foreknowledge. For whom he foreknew, he did predestine, be conformed to the image of his son. Okay. All right, uh, let's go ahead and finish reading down here. Verse 23, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. When did he afore prepare them for, unto glory? When he foreknew them, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the key to this. Uh, Even us whom he called, not all the Jews only, but also the Gentiles, as he said in Hosea, or Hosea, uh, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah, or Isaiah, uh, also cried concerning Israel. Notice he also cried concerning Israel. He's talking about Israel's uh, really la loss of her position for a season. The, uh, Concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord do it make upon the earth. And as Isaiah, or Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom, and we had been like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness. And, and even the righteousness, which is of faith, is of faith. But Israel, which followed in the law of righteousness, hath not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it. Uh, wherefore? Or why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Glory to God. All right. Let's go ahead and jump in here. Uh, I think we read this last week, but I think in order to kind of tie in and bring this up to snuff, we'll pick up in verse 18 in the commentary, uh, talking about verse 18, therefore he has mercy on whom he will have mercy, whom he will he hardeneth. Um, this is one of the strongest statements in the New Testament about the sovereignty of God's will. This must be, and this is why I'm going to read this again, this must be balanced with the many invitations in the New Testament to believe and accept Christ. God does not entice nor calls men to do evil. James 1, 13 and 14 says that every man is drawn away with his own lust. Okay? When people do wrong, it comes from their depraved nature. Just much like the mayor in Houston. 
That's a depraved nature. Okay? She's going after the church. You know, and then, of course, on the legal side, she's going to lose. And I, I, quite frankly, my, my desire is that the state charge her with abuse of power and bring her before a grand jury and incarcerate her until she uh, acknowledges she was wrong. Anyway. The, and I'm right. She needs to be charged with abuse of power. The rabbis of Paul's day looked upon God's covenant with Israel as such uh, that no matter how sinful Israel was, their place in God could never change. They held to the premise of absolute predestination. The Gentiles were to be destroyed, but nothing could dissolve God's covenant with the Jews. So here we have uh, why Paul wrote the things. You understand, their, their mindset was, we're God's chosen predestined people. That's all the way it is. No matter what we do, we're God's people. And the Gentiles are outside the covenant, without God, without hope in this world. And so no matter what they do, they're going to hell. <clears throat> Sounds like some of the grace teaching today. If you're born again, no matter what you do. Well, Paul radically obliterates this teaching or that mindset. Um, Paul meets the objection offered by sincere Jew Jewish believers. <coughs> <clears throat> they cannot understand how Israel, to whom belong the honors listed in chapters 9, nine verses 4 and 5, could be set aside for the Gentiles who were brought from the, their alienated and lost status to a place of blessing. The apostle proves that the word of God cannot fail. He makes a distinction between the natural offspring and the spiritual offspring. Uh, God accepted Israelites and those, or those of spiritual character. In other words, the, the, the natural number be as the sand of the seashore, a remnant shall be saved. Which ones? The one who received by faith. The righteousness which is by faith. God has um, perhaps the following illustration illustrates God's election. The door to the temple of the salvation says, whosoever will may come, but inside inscribe the message chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Whoever will will come, but you're chosen in him. In other words, you had to make the choice to come. God, what does it say? Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please God, for they that cometh to God. They cometh to God. They cometh to God. Must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God has always had total omniscience, a big word for all-knowing, uh, omniscience, all in science, knowledge, all knowledge. So he's all-knowing he's all or has all knowledge. Foreknowing all things, potential and actual. Because he is God, he can have total uh, prescience. <laughs> Whoa, glory to God. Ow, I feel good. All right. And yet allow men to make genuine choices of their own wills. Man's will is not free in the absolute sense as God's is, but he, he is total, um, man's will, man is totally free in the decision as to who will be his master, God or Satan. In other words, man is not a free spirit in the sense that he can exist outside of God's kingdom or Satan's kingdom. He can't exist and operate outside of one of those two realms. He is a subordinate spirit in the sense that he, he has to operate within one of those two realms, yet he has the will or the right to choose which realm he'll function in. Okay? He can't go out there and be oh, I'm not going to serve God. I'm not going to serve the devil. I'm going to go out and do my own thing. Well, you don't, you don't, no, he's not totally free in that sense. But he is sent free in the sense to choose which kingdom he'll operate within. Okay? Um, the choice determines his eternal destiny. Verse 20 uh, who are thou that replies against God it is encourages for the creature, the judge, the creator. Man, man, men are not lost because, they, because God hardened them. Men are not lost because God hardened them. They are hardened because they are lost. They are lost because they are sinners. God is not responsible for man's sin. He offers mercy to all. Okay, going on to verse 21 and 2, have the power over the potter, the power over the clay. And I don't think we got this far last week. Okay. Uh, of the same love to make one vessel unto honor, unto honor and another unto dishonor. What if God is willing to show his wrath, to make known his power, endure with much long suffering? Uh, the apostle offers another illustration of God's sovereignty. As the potter has absolute sovereignty over the clay, so God has absolute sovereignty over men. God does not need to answer man because he is infinite and independent. Even though he is unanswerable for what he does, there you go, he can be trusted to act in consistency 
with his character. See, some people take the sovereignty of God and then have him do things that are inconsistent with his character. God acts in consistency with his character because he's God. And he can't, he can't, he is who he is. And so if he is the Lord that healeth thee, that is, that is his character. If he's the Lord your peace, that's his character. If he's love, that's his character. All these things are God acts in consistency with. And even though he's sovereign, he doesn't change. I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not waver. Remember this? Uh, uh, the Weymouth translation um, uh, where it talks about, you know, God, doesn't, God is not a waverer between yes and no, but it was and always is with him. Yes, and our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. Notice, I love that part before it gets to that. There, it says, God was not a waver between yes and no. God's the same. When you come to God in prayer and you come on the basis of his word, God doesn't go, yeah, I'm just sovereign. I'm not going to do that because I just don't feel like doing it. That's inconsistent with his character. Amen. Ask. What? It shall be given. Seek. Knock. And it shall be opened unto you. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Amen. And we know that we, whatever petitions we desire of him, we have them. Amen. Over in 1 John. Um, and though he is free to act according to his pleasure, he is patient and full of long suffering. His sovereignty is exercised in mercy. The potter may take a lump of clay, twisting it in half. He places one part on the workable and makes of it a beautiful, graceful, almost priceless piece of pottery. On, out of the same lump of clay, he will take the other half and make it a common, ordinary vessel that could be bought for a few cents at some store. Both vessels are made from the same lump of clay by the same potter. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2 illustrates, through 12 illustrates this point very well. Isolate this passage from other Bible truths. And it seems to suggest partiality on God's part. Unfortunately, some taking it out of context have made it into a basic doctrine. They have divorced teaching on election from teaching on divine foreknowledge, resulting in a religious fatalism giving license to sin. In other words, you can't help it. You don't know if you're going to go to heaven or not. If you're going to go to, you know, um, we have somebody in church that grew up there. They're, 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 they grew up in a family that's, that's you can, I, I forgot they call them um, primitive Baptists. And then you're talking about sovereignty and election. They don't even know if they're going to heaven or not. Well, how do you know when you, get, when you, when you leave? And there's nothing you can do to change your destiny. Am I, am I right, Brother Bill? Am I? Yeah. You're going to hell or you're going to heaven. And when you were born, that was already decided, and there's nothing you can do about it. Next, the question, why do you go to church? <laughs> Hoping you might be one, <laughs> you know. Well, the problem with that is there's so many other scriptures that violate that, right. that premise. Right. And what happens is, in that case, you be, it becomes fatalistic. And I'm going to tell you, if I knew for sure I was going to hell, you better party it up on this side because the party's over when you leave. Hello. I mean, get it all in while you can, because when you leave, you're going to hell. At least you had some fun before you, before you ended up there. And that's not Bible. That's, 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 that's not how God operates. Hello. No, it's, it is not a fatalistic, and it's not, it's not giving you a license to sin. God does not make you a sinner so you can go out and sin, and that's just the way it is. All right? Verse 23 and, and, that he might, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he have for prepared unto glory. The omnipotent God may do with that, with that which belongs to him just as he wills. Even so, if a distorted teaching of election were correct, and if God would assign certain men to go to hell and certain men to go to heaven, God would still be just because he, was, he would be disposing of his property as he, as he will. In other words, their, their argument is, even if God did do that, he would still be just because he's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. He's an omnipotent God. God's sovereignty, however, is always in harmony with divine foreknowledge. Being omniscient or all-knowing, knowing the end from the beginning and knowing before the world was ever made uh, what I would do concerning his son, knowing what, that all my decisions would be, God predestined me 
as a Christian to be conformed to the image of his son and to be made an heir of the inheritance of life that is in Christ Jesus. God in his mercy has based his every move and plan upon his divine foreknowledge of choices we would make. And so you got people teach, well, you made this choice because he made you make them. No. If that were the case, he would have never... He would have never let Adam sin. Now, the Bible says Jesus was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Why? Because when he conceived in his own spirit to create man, he saw man fall. And so he already had Jesus ready to go. Amen. Hello. See, I, I, I just kind of, God, when God makes a plan to do something, he's going to do it. When he started planning to make, create man and have a free, free moral agent to worship him and follow him, uh, he saw man fall. He created a plan to get man back. God's patience is revealed again and again. The judgments of his wrath have always been preceded, preceded with much long suffering. Man, I'm telling you, if God cooked people the minute they did something wrong, we wouldn't have a whole lot of folk left. I mean, it would be boom, boom. You'd be riding down the road and sitting in the next car, somebody in the car next to you would just go up in flames. <laughs> Are you here? Hallelujah. His wrath has always been preceded with much long suffering. This was true of Cain, of Pharaoh, of Lot, and Sodom. Warning after warning is given until the offender crosses in some invisible line and there remains no more repentance but a fearful, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, found in Hebrews 10 27. So, you know, the, the, the gracie lovers refuse to accept that there is a judgment side of God. You can't preach judgment because God's love. No, God's love is why he keeps extending mercy. God's love is why he keeps extending mercy. God's love is why he keeps giving an opportunity. But when you harden your heart, as Pharaoh did, over and over and over and over and over, eventually, my spirit would not always strive with man. I was listening to Dad Hagen, an old tape series. <clears throat> He's talking about um, his sister's husband, who left, left them, went out, and, and um, ran after some trollop. And, um, you know, God kept dealing with him. And God kept... Brother Hagen, he left in the midst, said, go, you go tell so-and-so. And so he got in his car and drove all night and met him on the street corner and said, the Lord sent me to talk to you. He said, you, you, need, you need to, you know, and talked about the fact that he was living with a, a, a whore, left his wife, left his kids, would, you know, had a good heart in, in the sense that he would, he'd give him shirt off his back, but he, he wanted to live in, in that world of sin. He said, the, the Lord spoke to me. The Lord told me to come here. The Lord told me to tell you. You need to get right. I know it. I know it. He said, I know it. He said, here we go. I know it, Kenneth. I know it. I know I need to get right. But I'm just not going to do it. And he kept praying for him, praying for him. He said one day he was praying for him, and he said, get up from there. The Lord spoke to him. Don't ever call his name before me again. No, Lord, Lord, you know, if I don't, no, you can't mean that. Don't ever call his name before my throne again. He said, didn't you see in my word where I said leave Ephraim to his idols? Because he rebelled against God and rebelled against God and rebelled against God and God dealt with him and God dealt with him and God dealt with him and after, and after he, he just extended that mercy, extend, he said leave him to his idols. He's joined unto his idols. He said, don't ever call his name before my throne again. So what happened? He said they told him he died cursing God with his last breath. New, no. new. No. So you harden your heart. You harden your heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart and hardened his heart and hardened his heart. And after 10 attempts to, to, to deal with him and to, and to bring repentance, he kept on God hardened, and then God hardened his heart, and his judgment came. That's the Old Testament. Folks, behold the goodness of and the severity of God. The New Testament says, my spirit will not always strive with man. God deals with people, and he gives them latitude, and he gives them opportunity, and he, he deals with them and deals with them and deals with them. 
and sends people to deal with them. But I'll tell you, have you ever read any of these threads now uh, when something's where, where the Christians are being bait out the, the bad guy and go read the threads? These people are evil against Christians and, and mock God. There's no fear of God even amongst, I mean, used to be even when you were a sinner, you had a fear of God. Not anymore. They mock God openly. Just, I mean, blatantly mock God. I don't like to tell people this, hey, 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 bozo, if I'm wrong and you're right and there's nothing after this life, nobody will ever know it. But if I'm right and you're wrong, you're in a tough pickle. Is that a chance you want to take? They mock God. Verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. Not only has God been long suffering in judgment, but the bestowal of his mercy has always been impartial and all of grace. There's no difference between the Jew or the Gentile. The called were not found among the Jews, were not, I'm sorry, the called were not found among the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. The promise of salvation was not based on nationality, but is of him that calleth. Whom did he call? For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And whom he predestined, he also called. Amen. I said amen. What, he called us. Those he knew would accept Jesus, Jew or Gentile, he called us. Amen. 25, as he said in Hosea, or Hosea, I will call them my people, which are not a people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the children of the living God. Hosea, through his own tragic domestic life, saw a picture of the relationship between God and Israel. When he took Gomer as his wife, and she later gave birth to a son, he acknowledged the child as his. But he was convinced um, that the second and third children were not his. The names he gave them expressed his disappointment. Lo, Ruama, meaning one uh, for whom no natural affection is felt. How would you have me name that? And um, Lo, Ami, Ami, meaning no kin of mine. Their names pictures God's attitude towards his people Israel. But God will not allow the broken relationship to remain forever. He looks forward to the day when those who at present are estranged from him will again be his people. And when those who now have no claim of his, on his kindly feelings will again be the objects of his mercy. There is a principle of divine action at work in God's extension of his mercy. He is always desirous of restoring those who have departed from his favor. Now let me say something. There is no such thing as a Messianic Jew. Now people get cute with all these terms. They use these terms that the Jew who gets born again has no greater state than the believer, the Gentile who got born again. You're a believer. The term Messianic Jew is not used in the New Testament. And the beginning of the church was predominantly Jewish. I don't believe in the term. I don't like the term. It sets the Jews, the natural Jews, as a different class. And the Bible says there's the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. There's a natural lineage of Abraham. There's the Gentile outside the, the covenants of God and the church of God, the believers. And if you're a Jew and you're a believer, you're a believer. You're a Christian. The bunch that got called Christians at Antioch were Jews. They were not called Messianic believers or Messianic Jews. We come up with these terms because they sound cute. Oh, we, we, you know, you get born again, you stop being a Jew of the natural, you become a Jew in the spirit. You had the circumcision of the heart, not of the flesh. We think we're going to win them by being cute. You're not going to win Jews by being cute. You're going to win them by preaching the gospel and they, and they believing it. <clears throat> Amen. And you can, get, you can get so caught up with, with Judaism and studying the past, you can get so caught up in that stuff that you miss the mark. Amen. If, it was, if you had... If you had to be a Jewish, Jewish scholar to reach Jews, then Paul would have been the apostle to the Jews. Right. Instead, God sent him to the Gentiles. 
Well, all that education didn't do him a bit of good. And Peter, who would have been a great Gentile preacher, got sent to the Jews. Hello? Are you here? Why? Because it had nothing to do with all the other stuff. It had to do with the fact they were anointed to do what they were called to do. One was sent to the Gentiles, one was sent to the Jews, and not their natural education and their natural whatever didn't play into it at all. Talking about somebody who had been the great guy to go to the Jews, Paul. He knew all the stuff. He was a doctor of the law. And God sent him over to the heathens who didn't know squat about it. And then Peter was a fisherman, rambunctious, probably skipped synagogue every week. And God sent him to the Jews. But remember what they said about the apostles, the disciples before uh, Paul got in there and they all beat him and threatened him and all this stuff? They took note of them. They were ignorant and unlearned men, but they'd been with Jesus. Hallelujah. Where was I? Oh, we're talking about all those. Yeah. There's a principle. <laughs> There is a principle of divine action at work in God's extension of his mercy. He is always desirous of restoring those who have departed from his favor. The Gentile rejection of God is described in a general way in the first chapter, verses 18 through 32. Just as God promised to restore Israel to his love and favor, he promised grace and mercy to the Gentiles. The revelation that Jews and Gentiles stood on equal ground before God was astonishing to the Jews. Hmm. As the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, Paul placed great importance on that revelation. He called it mystery, which was kept secret since the, the world began. Uh, Ephesians 1, uh, 3, 1 through 9 explains this mystery, defined as the Gentiles should be fellow heirs to Christ. It was always God's will that all men be saved. Ruth is one example of the Gentiles who came to God through Jewish witness. When God chose Abraham, it was with the intent that all the world be blessed. Remember that? In blessing, I'll bless thee, and multiply, I'll multiply. If he who blesses you, I'll bless, who, I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. Amen? And what, is, what kind of faith is it? The faith of Abraham that we're to follow after. Isn't that right? The Jews had lost a sense of their reason for being. When they failed to take the word to all, both they and the Gentiles suffered inestimable loss. God's dealing with Israel was based on his wisdom, his sovereignty, his word, the prophecy of Hosea foretold a revival by which the blessing of God would ultimately reach Gentiles also. No Gentiles had ever been called the people of God. But now both Jews and Gentiles are brought into the church, the great New Testament body. This is what Paul's trying to relate to the Jews. It's not, this is not a thing for you. The whole thing, you were the lineage to get Messiah here, to get the Redeemer here, so that all men could be saved. And you don't get some special pass just because it came through your line. You don't get a pass. On believing by faith you don't get a pass on receiving by faith you still have to receive by faith what did, for God so loved the world the master of the church the, the master the head of the church said for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life whosoever it was to everybody I said it was to everybody we have stories in the New Testament of people outside the covenants of God who by faith received the blessing of God Amen? Um, 27 through 9, through 29, Isaiah, or Isaiah also cried concerning Israel that the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. Only a remnant should be saved. For he will finish a work and cut short in righteousness, but a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before them, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we have been in Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. In other words, we're talking about the Jews now. The prophecies, prophecies of Isaiah and Isaiah are quoted to show that the call of the Gentiles had been foretold. The backslidings and waywardness of Israel would result in the acceptance of but a remnant of a people as numerous as the sand of the sea. Hosea had said that God would make his people a people who would not his people. And this, this is in Hosea 2.23. And that those people would be called the sons of God, Hosea 1.10. He also showed how Isaiah had been made aware that Israel would, be, have been, would have been wiped out had not a remnant been left. Isaiah 10, 23, 2, 3, and 37, 32. The apostles saying that Israel would have known of her fate if she had listened to and understood the word of the Lord to her. 
The context of Isaiah's prophecy was an impeding Assyrian invasion of Israel. Only a minority survived the captivity and exile. Israel's elder son was named Shir Jeshub. A, a remnant will return. As a sign to Judah, only a remnant were true to God. Let me tell you something, folks. There's stuff going on, and there's the pressure to quit. There's the pressure to leave. There's the pressure to go the way of the world, and we have to remain faithful to God. <clears throat> this stuff going on in Houston is just a microcosm of what's going on all over the place. Like I said, I told some people before church, it's illegal to preach against homosexuality in Canada out of the church pulpit. They've made it illegal in Canada. Illegal to preach against homosexuality in Canada. You can't read the Bible, you can't preach the Bible about it. Yeah, you can't publicly read Romans 1 in, in Canada because, the, the, because of lunatics, because of devils, people with demon-minded. And that's what they're trying to bring to the United States. And, of course, Houston is trying to implement it right now. And um, anyway, I don't want to face God in, 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 in opposing him. Well, we just got to love on people. Did you know Paul wrote one guy who withstood him? And he said, so-and-so withstood me. The Lord reward him according to his works. Oh, yeah. New Testament. You sloppy agape people. I'm, I've loved, I believe in the love of God. I believe the love of God's powerful. But, you know, uh, the love of God does not mean we just keep putting up with the attack on his kingdom. Jesus came to take Paul out. The Damascus Road, we thought, oh, I'd just love to have a Damascus Road experience. No, you wouldn't. Because Jesus came to meet Paul because he was breathing out threatenings against the church, and he showed up and knocked him off his horse. And he was either going to get saved that day or he was going to hell. Oh, no. Paul, Jesus didn't say, Paul, I love you. He said, Saul, Saul. And, and, uh, and, 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 well, actually, Saul says, who art thou? Lord, he said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. Actually, he says, Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the bricks. You're resisting me. You're fighting against me. And he said, you're persecuting me. And he showed it to deal with it. Everybody just says, oh, we just got to walk in love. You know, see, that's not the love of God to be stupid. It's not the, good, the love of God to slobber all over the place and say, do whatever you want to do. Drop kick me Satan through the goalpost of life. Well, I just sit here and let the, let the world destroy people's lives and take them to hell. Now, my love for humanity demands I resist the works of evil. Remember the governor, his deputy, who resisted the preaching of the gospel? And Paul said, or Peter said, I forget now, which one was it? You'll be blind for a season. Boom. He walked about looking for somebody to, to lead him about. Where's the, the, the lovey-dovey stuff in that? He was working against the work of God. Folks, I'm telling you, we, we can't just. Dark is getting darker. Light gets brighter. And I'm going to tell you, some folks are going to get caught in the crosshairs of, of messing with God's people and messing with people and trying to keep them from getting saved. And if you're determined to go to hell and try and take as many people as you will, God might let you go and get an early pass so you don't take anybody else with you. He might escort you. I don't believe that's Bible doctrine. Herod just took glory for being, remember that? When it comes to his church, the love of God for his church supersedes your right to keep going. Right. Ananias and Sapphira came into the church and brought something in there that would have been destructive to the church and fell dead because of it. Why is the Satan put it in your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? The same feet that took your husband out is going to take you out. Boom. Yeah. Herod began to think he was a god, and all the people worshiped him as a god, and the angel struck him, and he was eating of worms. Don't sound like a pleasant death. Just thinking, it didn't sound like a real pleasant death. There's a side to this that the church needs to understand. 
God loves humanity. But there are people who are emissaries of the devil who are doing everything they can to take people to hell and keep them from getting saved. They're investing with the wrong God. And he's not going to put up with it. The Apostle Paul at that time, Saul, encountered that. That encounter on the Damascus Road was a get saved to go to hell or a free go to hell card. Because that's where he was heading. He was not getting off that ground to continue persecuting his church. Now, Paul, who art thou, Lord? <laughs> what will you have me to do? <laughs> Confess him as Lord. Believe he was raised from the dead. He's looking at him. He got saved. Amen. How'd I get off on all that? Well, it's good anyhow. Only remnant would be true to God. Israel did not fail to uh, Israel did not fail of righteousness because of non-election. Their failure was their own fault. <clears throat> In other words, they did not get predestined by God to go out and rebel against God. They chose not to follow God. They stumbled over Christ. He's either a stepping stone or a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Um, amen. The 33rd verse of this chapter tells us that. It says, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. But those who don't believe stumble over him. Israel's stumbling, uh, stumbling stone was uh, the necessity of faith in Christ as the Messiah. See, they believed they had to keep the law, do all the things of the law, they had to do all this, all that. All that. They had to do that to get saved. Christ came and said, believe on me. And, um, and that became a stumbling stone. There, and they tripped there, and they became offended at Christ and rejected him. He became their stumbling stone. But when he came as the crucified, I'm sorry, they had prayed for, hoped for, looked for the promised Messiah, but when he came as the crucified Christ, they would not accept him. The cross was an offense to the Jew. Calvary did away with works and with legalism. They came by faith at that point in time. And you've got to understand, as always, <coughs> Um, people are making money. What's going to happen to the priesthood if we give into this teaching on Jesus Christ? No more lambs? All that kind of stuff. Verse 30, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have obtained a righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. This verse shows that the Gentiles have obtained that for which they had no desire. And then the Gentiles were just outside. They were doing their thing. And the Jews had failed in securing to that which they had devoted their lives. The condition of the Gentiles' would, world, apart from Christ, is pictured in Ephesians 2.12. We followed not after righteousness. Romans 3.11 tells us there is none that understands, none that seeketh after God. But now we, who were outside, with no aspiration spiritually or Godward, have through the infinite mercy and grace of God attained to the righteousness which the Jews desired, but were never able to attain. Now let me say this. Christ, the kingdom of God, did not come now, Jesus, remember, he said, I'm sent for the, lost, the, the sheep of the house of Israel, lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was to start the church. They were to, they were to go out and not proselyte, but to save the whole world. What did Jesus say when he ascended? Go ye into all the world. He didn't say go into Judaism. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. The kingdom was open to everybody. Everybody. Now, it was years later before it actually went to the Gentile world. Right. Remember, Paul said he was, he was now sent to the, to, the, to the Gentiles. All right? Verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained the law of righteousness. Hallelujah. What could Israel not attain to the righteousness they desired? Why could Israel not attain to the righteousness they desired? The key is in the preceding verse. The Gentiles have obtained righteousness by faith. In a sense, there are two kinds of righteousness. And, and the um, Weymouth, I believe it's Weymouth translation, uh, states and calls one law righteousness and one faith righteousness. Actually says it that way. So the righteousness, which is a faith, calls it, he says that, he says, the, righteous, the, the faith righteousness is this. Law righteousness is this, Okay. There is a, um, two kinds of righteousness. There is the righteousness which Paul describes, the righteousness 
which the Gentiles had obtained. <clears throat> there is the righteousness which the Jews sought after, what the Bible calls their own righteousness, which is this filthy rags. All that we receive from God comes through faith. We are saved by faith. We are justified by faith, not the works of the law. We have access to God's throne by faith. All we have, uh, all we have comes by faith is ent entirely divorced from works and self-effort. That doesn't mean, what's talking about works of the law? Because we're created in Christ Jesus under good works. See, you got these people come along and say, see, you, no works, no works, no works. No, 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 no. If you're born again, you're going to have good works. We're, we're divorced of becoming saved by works. You don't get forgiven by works. It's, you know, and people, anybody that teaches that going to God and repenting for sinning is a work is just biblically illiterate. Dishonest or both. And making a lot of money. That's where the dishonesty comes in. People sell people stuff that makes them a lot of money that's not biblical. And then when if they even, they come, a lot of times if they come to the truth, knowledge of the truth, they won't change because they lose the money flow. They lose, they, they lose the, rec, the uh, revenue flow. It's all based on faith. Paul makes the point clearly. The Jews have no claim to salvation as a national right. The way, the way was plain, but they refused to accept it. On the other hand, the Gentiles who were not seeking righteousness gladly accepted salvation by faith when they heard the good news of the gospel. By the hundreds and thousands, they turned to God from idols to serve the true and the living God and to wait for his son from heaven. Except for a believing remnant, the Jews turned in, turned in hatred on, all, on the Christians, driving them from their homes and scattering them abroad. Now remember... Where did Paul get the letters to bring the Christians bound? From the religious leadership. From the Pharisees and the Sadducees, from the, from the uh, Sanhedrin. They got the letters. They weren't from Herod. They were from the religious leaders. <clears throat> they rejected Jesus and turned in hatred towards the believers. All Jews believed the possession of the law of Moses was all that was required. Providing they lived by it. The goal was unattainable. The Bible tells us that. And when Messiah came, they rejected him. They wanted a militant lion. God sent a lamb. They wanted the throne. God gave the cross. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. The puzzling, haunting question is, how could Israel have missed out on righteousness when it was uh, ostensibly their number one concern, it is because they did not seek righteousness and the only way it can come, by faith. They, you can't come up with a plan and say it's got to be this way or no other way. And when the, when the answer comes, you don't change. As believers, when the, I'm telling you, when the, when the word of God is brought and it goes contrawise to your whatever, you just got to change. You just can't keep holding on to what you want because you have to admit you were wrong. I, that, that, that pastor told Brother Hagin. I know you're right, and I'm wrong. But for me to go to those services, and I'd be admitting that you're right and I'm wrong, and I'd rather die than do that. So he closed the meeting down that night, went to the next church, said he'll fall dead in this pulpit two weeks from Sunday, and he did. Now that's, that's stupidity gone to seed. You'd rather die than admit you're wrong? Just rather go on and die than admit you're wrong? If you're wrong, you're wrong. Hallelujah. Get, get forgiveness and go on. Amen. I'd rather live another 40 years and be wrong. Say, I was wrong. Then to keep going and just say, ah, I'd rather die than admit I was wrong. And boy, I lost where I was. I was the Jews, <clears throat> I'm sorry, their works of the law nullified faith and blinded them to God's righteousness, seen in Christ when he came. If God had intended that man could become righteous by his works, he would have never given his son to die. The Jews, like Cain, decided to bring what they wanted to bring rather than what God had commanded to be brought. They won't keep bringing the law. Verse 33, as it is written, 
I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, the rock of offense. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The major reason for the Jews' failure to obtain righteousness is they stumbled over Christ Jesus. That is implicit in, in um, this, there is implicit imagery in verse 30 and 31 of a race or an obstacle course <coughs> in the pursuit of righteousness. When Christ came across their path as the goal which they sought, the Jews inst in instead stumbled and fell, missing the goal entirely. God had forewarned Israel of the possibility of, failing, of falling as a result of stumbling over the coming one. Isaiah prophesied that the Lord of hosts will become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. That's found in Isaiah 8, 14, over which many would stumble and fall. In Isaiah 28, 16, foretold of a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, promising that he that believe, believeth shall not make haste. The psalmist foresaw, foresaw Jesus, the, the Jews' rejection of Jesus as he wrote, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner, Psalm 118, 22, and then is quoted in the New Testament. Jesus applied, to this prophecy, applied this prophecy to himself and warned his hearers that whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but whosoever it shall fall, it, uh, on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind into powder. In other words, if you fall on him, it will break you. It will break you of you, and you'll come into the kingdom. But if you reject it and it falls on you, you'll be ground to powder. Now, Jesus said that. He should have just told them he loved them. I know it's a little sarcastic, but people just come up with this stuff and they don't read their Bibles. They just leave Scripture out that they don't like. You can't leave out what you don't like. Why? Because God had it put in there for you to hear. You don't get a choice. Hello? You're three years old and you've got to eat your lima beans. Now, when you get older, you can reject your lima beans, and I have. I will eat them in Brunswick too. Parker's Brunswick's too. When Jesus asked the Jewish leaders to explain Psalm 118, 22, they had no answer. That's what we find out in Luke 20, 17. When he applied it to himself, they understood his claim and tried to take him for trial, but his time had not yet come. The joyous aspect of the stumbling stone is that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Isaiah 28, 16 stated that the believer would not make haste. The two ideas are uh, uh, complimentary. The believer rests on the solid rock, Christ Jesus. He does not have to rush about in anxiety, in anxiety, but he can move in deliberation and peace. Jesus will never allow him to be put to shame. In a world of mutability and uncertainty, Jesus never changes. Okay. Amen. Next week we'll get in chapter. I don't know if we're going to read from this. I wanted to read chapter nine's commentary out here because it's, it helps clarify so much. And you may have to go back and listen to it on the tape again because there's a lot there. Um, but it does show, that it deals with that sovereignty issue, it deals with the, you know, uh, you have to interpret those things in light of, of, of the other parts of the Bible. You just can't take them out of their setting. It'd be like me taking, somebody taking something out of my sermon that I say, completely outside the parameters of, of everything that went around it, and then saying, Pastor Ed said such a, see, see? And then when you put it, all the other stuff around it, it's not what you said. Or that's not, the, that's not how it was, should be interpreted. Right. With everything else around it, it makes a different meaning. Yeah. Amen? I could be preach, preaching along and talking about the love of God and saying, and some people might say, God doesn't love anybody. He wants everybody to go to hell. Somebody could take that out of that sermon and, and say, and Pastor Ed Taylor said, God don't love anybody. He wants everybody to go to hell. And spread it around and play the clip of me saying that and leave all the other stuff off around it. And that's what I said. Well, that's what he said. Yeah, but you didn't put all the stuff around it. And that happens all the time in court cases. <coughs> the lawyers do that trick all the time. They take stuff out of the setting and use it, and then won't let you say it, won't let you give it, give it the, the, um, the setting in which it was said and the words that were around it. They just took something out, and then they use it to make a point and shut you down and sway the jury. And you never did say what they said. You, 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 the import of what you said was not what you said because you had to take everything else around it. So God loves everybody. God loves the whole human race. Some people might say God doesn't love everybody. He wants everybody to go to hell. But I want you to know God does love everybody. You take that one part out. You can make me say it. And I did say it. But I didn't say it with that intent. 
And if you listen to the whole, you understand that. When you listen to the whole of the Bible and understand the whole of the Bible, you understand Romans 9 does not present the sovereign election, God's going to send you to hell and use nothing you can do about it. Case changes the whole thing. Amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.